All right, guys. Talk about ultrasound for DVT. Have you seen this lecture yet? Is this repeating? No, right? This is new. Okay. <laughs> I give it so many times, I forget who I give it to. But so with uh, DVT stands for deep vein thrombosis. And what happens is you could have uh, an abnormality in the coagulation cascade in the body. Have you learned about the coagulation cascade yet? Yeah? Cool. Yeah. So you can have an abnormality there, like a protein CRS deficiency, which predisposes you to having blood clots. Or you could have a prolonged period of stasis where you're sitting on an airplane for 14 hours or something, uh, and then the blood can pool in your lower extremities, right? And they, patients come in with blood clots in their veins then, or, or deep vein thromboses or DVTs. Um, or you could have injury to the vessel wall from orthopedic surgery or a motorcycle accident or something like that. So whether it's uh, an inherent problem with the coagulation cascade um, or if it's um, prolonged stasis or vessel injury, endothelial injury, all three of those things can predispose you to having a blood clot in your lower or upper extremities. And the way we can look for that is with ultrasound. What we use is the linear transducer. The linear transducer in these cases, of course, it's sometimes referred to, some people call this um, a vascular probe, but we can use it for so many more things than just blood vessels. And what's the biggest blood vessel in the body? The aorta. It's a deeper structure. You wouldn't want to use this probe on the aorta because you got to get the sound to penetrate all the way down to the spine, basically, to see the aorta. So that's why I don't really like calling this the vascular probe because it's got so many uses and you wouldn't want to use it on the biggest blood vessel. So I always call it the linear probe. Um, but just so you know, you might hear someone call this the vascular probe. And it's the one with the highest uh, frequency. So in terms of the leg veins, I know you haven't had this anatomy yet, um, but uh, this was the only time we could get in to do this lecture. Essentially, um, you've got that in the inguinal area up there, or the, um, the inguinal, sometimes called the inguinal canal right along here. This is the inguinal ligament that's going along here. Okay, you can see some muscle bellies here. But this orientation of the nerve here and then the, um, the femoral nerve, and then the femoral artery, and then the femoral vein is seen uh, medially to it. And the way I remember that the vein is more medial than the artery is the rhyme venous rhymes with penis. penis. Good, venous penis. Someone you heard that one already. So you could say venous vagina if you wanted to, too. So, um, but so that's because that's, sometimes people say other things. And I think that's just easy to remember, um, kind of rhymes, that that's the most medial structure would be the vein. And so... Um, we can see the common femoral vein very easily until it kind of dives down underneath uh, some of the muscles and fascial layers uh, more distally down the thigh. And so what happens when you get down into this adductor canal, or sometimes called the superficial femoral canal, it gets very difficult to insinate or to view the, um, the femoral vein. Um, and then it pops out of that canal and goes behind the knee and turns into the popliteal vein. Okay, so it courses down here, um, starts off as the common femoral vein, and then there's a little deep branch, uh, the profundus, that goes down, um, of the deep femoral vein that goes down. It's a very small caliber vein. It's sort of not of that much clinical uh, significance usually. Um, so really you're seeing this um, common femoral vein come all the way down until it reaches the superficial femoral canal. And sometimes at that point people call it the superficial femoral vein, even though technically it's still a deep femoral vein. There's some weird nomenclature going on here that you're going to encounter when you learn this stuff in your textbooks. Um, but to suffice it to say, it's got very easy visibility up here in the groin area that you will see today on your models, and also behind the knee in the popliteal area. So this is what it looks like. Um, so let me ask you guys a question. Knowing full well that the indicator goes to the patient's right, this is a transverse view of this patient's um, femoral, common femoral vein, superficial femoral artery, and deep femoral artery, okay? Let me ask you something. Just based on this, knowing that venous is more medial to the penis, venous penis, which leg is this, the right leg or the left leg? Very good, the left leg. The other way you can look at up here in the picture, they're scanning the patient's left leg. Excellent. And so what's happening is this femoral vein I drew here on my fellow comes down his leg here, and it has a little bit awkward, but uh, it comes down his leg and dives in the superficial femoral canal. This is where it's really hard to insinate or to view. But up here, the first sort of third or half of this is fair game with ultrasound. And then once it comes in the pop, 
it's easy to see again. And in the popliteal vein, in the popliteal fossa, I should say, the vein comes to the top in the pop. That's my rhyme there. Uh, and here's the vein. It's coming to the top of the screen because we're looking posteriorly. Indicator still to the patient's right, and the artery is deeper. Now, if you look this image up in Netter, um, Frank draws it sort of, they're sort of left and right, medial lateral to each other, whereas uh, I, I see it more realistically anterior posterior or posterior anterior to each other. So it's not this side by side thing the way he tries to make it seem. Sometimes it's that way. Normally, though, I see it very um, posterior anterior. Okay? And then, so there's a, and then there's all kinds of configurations and um, options here. Sometimes you see a little bifurcation of this uh, short little saphenous vein that comes off, and then there's this anterior tibial vein that comes off. There's some fibular veins and posterior tibial veins, and the whole thing gets very bifurcated as you're um, as you're going distally here, and um, and it's just there's all these venous tributaries and stuff. But just in the popliteal fossa, it's considered a deep vein, a very large caliber vein that if it develops a clot, can easily move up um, into the femoral system. And then, where does it go after that? It goes from the femoral system up, where does it go? It goes up the IVC, the IVC and then it gets into which part of the heart? Right atrium. right atrium, goes down to the right ventricle, and then it becomes, from a DVT, it becomes a pulmonary embolism, or PE and uh, about 200,000 people every year in the United States die from a pulmonary embolism. So that's why these things are clinically uh, important. And this is, uh, I kind of drew the bifurcation here a little bit uh, on the back of his leg. Now, when you do the scan, what I do is I hold the probe in one hand and then I put my hand, my other hand on the patient's knee and I use that as sort of counterbalance or counteraction to push those two, thing, two things together. Now, on our models here today, you may forget to do that. Their legs are pretty small, but on on uh, the range of uh, body habitus that we encounter clinically in the emergency department, you'll, you're going to really want to kind of get in there and use both your hands counter, counterbalancing each other. And so try to remember to do that today when you're practicing uh, this, this test. And, um, and when you do a normal study, when there's no blood clot there, it's very, very simple. It's the compression. Either it compresses or it doesn't. So this is without compression. I can see the common femoral artery here the common femoral vein. So which leg is this? Good, the right leg. The indicator here is to the patient's right. So this is more lateral. This is more medial. And I'm looking at the right leg. SV, what do you suppose that stands for? Saphenous vein. Uh -huh. It's a superficial uh, vein, very close to the skin line. So we're pretty up high in the groin. We're very superior when we start doing this, okay? Right where the confluence of the saphenous comes in. I mean, you're really, you're really like, right up in that inguinal area where you start this test. And then you compress. And if everything goes away except the artery, there's no clot there. The vein should be easily compressible, as you guys have seen so far going through some of the stuff that you're doing. So that's normal. When um, This is what it looks like on video when you're doing it. So the, the superficial deep femoral arteries have bifurcated, and we're seeing the common femoral vein here, um, easily compressible. So that's normal. And then when there's a clot there, it looks like this. Um, it's not compressible anymore. And it's very simple. It's just a non-compressible venous structure um, that has an, a thrombus in it. Sometimes the thrombus is echogenic, like you can see it. It's, it's hyperechoic like it is here. Other times, though, the thrombus is not echogenic. You don't see it. But it's there because you know it's there because it's not compressing. So it's really the compressibility more so than it is the echogenicity of the thrombus. And that's a really important distinction to make. Just because you don't think you see one there, it's really all about the compression. And you've got to push pretty hard to get it to compress. If it doesn't wink back, there's a DVT. Now, the vein comes to the top and the pop. This is a normal popliteal uh, vein over here that's easily compressible. You see it up there? You know, they've got the depth way down at 5.5. I would probably decrease that depth to 4 something so that this takes up more screen real estate, right? Now, when there's a clot there, and this is a good example of it, here's the artery. It's actually, we're pushing so hard that the artery is kind of compressed, and there's a large uh, echogenic thrombus sitting uh, right here. Look how big that popliteal vein got. We see that a lot with, with DVTs. The vein actually gets like dilated out to its maximal diameter. Okay, so 
The other thing is if you guys come across a DVT and you're scanning, um, at that point, get, you know, record, record it, and we'll get more into how to the machine record stuff later, but it's not the time to, like, start showing everybody this and compressing it over and over again because you could potentially dislodge the clot and mobilize it to a pulmonary embolism. So that's why once, it looks like I keep compressing it, but it's just the video that keeps looping itself around here. So uh, for teaching purposes, once you uncover this, make sure you just grab it on video and, um, and then show it to somebody right away. So when you go down the leg, you're wondering to yourself, how far apart do I space my compressions? Do I go like every single millimeter or is it okay to like skip a centimeter? It turns out it's okay to skip and just do one centimeter increments going down the leg. So I start really high from the inguinal region at the, at the uh, inguinal canal, as high as I can, where the saphenous vein dumps in, and then I compress and I do one centimeter increments down the leg until basically I'm about halfway down the leg or until I lose sight of the um, femoral vein. Because in patients who have um, clots in their legs, they're not like little tiny one millimeter clots. They, they're like long segments of clot. They, they involve multiple segments, actually. And so it's usually more of a, a larger process. So it's okay to go one, one centimeter uh, increments. Yes? Do they have pain associated with the exact spot where the clot would be? Or is it just like Very mild, achy, kind of swelly, congestion-y sort of pain there. It's not like acute, severe, excruciating pain like you have with other stuff like maybe appendicitis. Um, there's a color technique called augmentation. And um, augmentation is where you put the probe up in the groin and you're looking at the femoral region, you put on color, and then you squeeze the calf and you should see flow fill the vein because of the, um, assuming that there's patency there between the calf and the femoral area. If the veins are patent, you should see flow light up in there. And for years, people got really into this augmentation. However, it's completely, um, largely, I should say, fallen out of favor because it doesn't have good test characteristics to diagnose a DVT or not. And so you can't rely on augmentation. It's a fun thing to do. I do it all the time. It's sort of a, a geeky ultrasound thing I love to do, but I can't rely on it. It's really only the grayscale compression alone, the, the 2D ultrasound image, the grayscale, no color involved, that's what rules in or out the DVT. Not, there's lots of other color techniques that don't stand up under um, clinical conditions, and so you can't really use that. Even though today we'll probably be doing it because it's fun to see the anatomy link up that way. I think that's cool and stuff to show you, but diagnostically it's not useful. Now, this is an example here of um, what do you guys, what do you guys think? Now this is a little bit, tr this one's a little bit sort of a conundrum and I like to show the trickier ones, not so much the obvious ones sometimes to, to give you guys a feeling for some of the challenges that are out there. First of all, which leg is this? Good, the left leg. So this is the artery over here. This is the vein trying to compress right here. But if you notice, the vein doesn't all the way compress. You see how this is one little segment right there where these walls are just not coming together, right? It's subtle, but once in a while, right there, we see it, you know? This is a person who's got a non-occlusive uh, DVT on the left leg there. And so when it's non-occlusive like that, it's partially occlusive. I mean, the blood's still going by. The patient's like, I don't know, my leg seems like it's kind of swelling. And so, you know, that's, uh, those can still dislodge and go up and cause a PE. So it's still a very important thing. And you could see how you could miss it. And so this is a, this is a pitfall. We use that term pitfall in medicine to describe an area where you can get kind of hung up or in trouble. So keep in mind that that's a pitfall there when, there's a, when, it's, a, when it's not totally occlusive yet, okay? Now, how about this one? What's going on here? Here's another pitfall. Where are we? Hard to know. Turns out, now you know. See that? This kind of gets at the Frank Netter drawing. Actually, interesting after I told them that you don't see this. I'm going to pause it when it becomes clear where we are and have you for pushing right there and then there. So this is the popliteal fossa. Good. Now, why is it that we didn't see that 
why is it we just see something pulsating there? We see the artery, we don't see the vein. Why do you think that is? Yeah, exactly right, pushing too hard. So you're staring at this, you're like, where's the vein? Where's the vein? I'm like, whoa, whoa, ease up a little bit, man. Pump the brakes. And then you can see the vein pop right open, okay? So a lot of that is technique. You'll get the hang of that as you move through the rest of your um, stations today. So how about this? Which leg is this? Right leg, because this is the femoral artery here, and there's the femoral vein compressing down there. What the heck is that up here? That's what was drawing my eye. And the first time I saw that thing, I didn't know what to make of it. I thought the patient had DDT. But you know what? These patients come in many times who are struggling clinically between, you know, you've, they've got this red kind of swollen leg, and you're like, yeah, I don't know. Is, it, is, it, there's an, is there an infection here? Is this cellulitis? Or is there a blood clot here? And so this is one way to kind of help differentiate that. You look for a DVT, and it's easily compressible. There's no DVT. And then you see that thing up there. What is that thing up there? If you look at there, there, right? There. This is a very enlarged lymph node. And we see that in cases of infection. So there's an infection downstream, down the leg, maybe around the lower extremity, somewhere around the calf or something. It's all red, the skin's kind of red, the leg is kind of swollen. And then you don't see DVT, but you see a really enlarged lymph node. It helps sway you clinically towards cellulitis or infection and away from DVT. That's an inguinal lymph node. Okay. Correct, inguinal lymph node. Uh huh. That's enlarged, okay. prominent. Usually you don't really see them. But this one looks like a little miniature kidney or something. Yeah. They're very vascular too. If you put flow on them and you turn down the pulse repetition frequency, something we're going to talk a lot more about next year, you can make the, the flow very sensitive. You can see those lymph nodes really light up. They're cool. So this is a little old lady that came in complaining of leg swelling. What do we see here? Not compressible, so there's DVT where? Right leg, so this is the femoral artery up here. She's a little tiny thing. This is her femoral artery up here, and this is her femoral vein right here. And once in a while, boom, it's not compressible. Right there, it's not compressible. Now, technique-wise, yeah, definitely. Decrease this depth, maximize your screen real estate, maybe turn the gain up a little bit. You know, there's some things I would do here to make this look better. And sometimes I like showing the not perfect ones to you guys so we can talk about some of those image um, enhancement stuff. So that's a femoral vein DVT there on the right. We're going to change gears now to talk about the aorta. So there's about 30,000 deaths a year occur because of abdominal aortic aneurysms that rupture. Okay. This is usually most commonly in males greater than the age of 60. And there's this classic triad, which is somebody comes in with abdominal pain, uh, hypotension, and then when you go examine them, they have this pulsatile abdominal mass. That's only present, that classic triad. You're going to find all kinds of things that are classic in medicine that are not actually useful because they're only present 25% of the time. So if you say, well, they don't have that triad, I don't think they have a triple A, think again, because really the only way to rule this out is with ultrasound or CT scan. But in the unstable patient, ultrasound is really the test of choice. Now, the problem with these triple A's, abdominal aortic aneurysms, is that they can be asymptomatic right up until the moment they rupture. You know who had one? It was Rodney Dangerfield. Did you know that? Yeah, he had a triple A. And then he's like on all these brochures for triple A's and stuff. He's like, Arr, you know, check your aorta out. Um, but, but um, and once they rupture, the mortality is incredibly high. Like 80% of the people die right there. 60% die even before they get to the hospital, like in the ambulance or when they're waiting for the ambulance to get there. Um, and it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty bad. So... If we can um, not misdiagnose these things as clinicians, we're really helping out these patients, okay? And this actually happened to my uncle. My uncle, I only have one uncle, and we do a lot of, we hang out a lot, and he's really cool. Uh, so he goes to, he lives in Virginia Beach though, so he goes to this ER in Virginia Beach with back pain, okay? This is about two years ago now. 
when he was 57 years old, he goes to the ER with back pain, history of hypertension, and because he's got atrial fibrillation, he's on Coumadin. Okay, so it's a blood thinning agent. And so he goes there, he's got back pain, they check his urine, he's got blood in his urine, they think, well, you, you probably have a kidney stone, we'll give you some Vicodin, and they send him home. They didn't do any other tests on him. On Coumadin. Right. History of hypertension right. with back pain, right. He's got some blood in his urine, and they're like, yeah, you probably, you know, so, right, so, well, so then he, uh, he goes back five days later saying, look, doc, I'm not, I'm not kidding, to the same ER, actually got the same doctor. Uh, I'm not kidding, man. I never get pain and my back, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how much my back hurts. And so he's like, well, I don't know. Maybe that kidney stone's worse than I thought. Let's get a CT scan. And so, because most ER doctors to this day still don't do bedside ultrasound, right? And so they go straight to CT. They don't even, if on the first, well, you'll, I'll get to that. So they do a CT scan and he's got a 10 centimeter, nor, a normal size aorta is less than two centimeters. He's got a 10 centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm that's leaking. Okay, on Coumadin. I'm not gonna shove my face, I'm gonna keep going. On Coumadin, and so this is like a catastrophic event that's occurring to my uncle. They ship him from this little ER in Virginia Beach to Eastern Virginia Medical School where he goes to the OR. In the OR he gets, uh, it's a 10 hour surgery by the chief of vascular surgery. He gets 40 units of blood transfusion. He's, and then he makes out of the OR he spends a month on a ventilator in the ICU. He gets a trach, he gets peg, all this stuff. Falls out of his bed one day in the ICU because he's agitated and breaks his hip. I mean, all these things just went downhill for the guy. Uh, anyway, so I, I, you know, I'm out there, I'm visiting him. It's just an incredibly stressful situation for everybody. It's my only uncle. And he makes it through. He's fine today. He made it through this whole event, and luckily. And he says to me when we talk about this, well, you know, Chris, I really owe my life to that ER doctor who, you know, did the CTs, thought to do the CT scan. And, uh, and I explained to him that that ER doctor actually is an assassin and <laughs> tried to kill you. And you owe your life to that vascular surgeon who cleaned up the mess that ER doctor created for you and for everybody. And so, so I think it's an important story to share with people because this is a situation where bedside ultrasound you know, really, and this was two years ago. I've been teaching stuff for 10 years, right? Best ultrasound really would have helped, you know, lower the threshold for the doctor to consider a AAA in this patient with back pain. That's the classic symptom. So that's really why I think bedside ultrasound is essential because even if it's not ruptured, it's amazing how much work you can, good work you can do by screening for this problem, primary care, wherever you are in medicine, okay? So... And as you move into next year, when you guys are doing physical exams with your ultrasound machines, you may uncover this. And one of the, the patients you're seeing somewhere precepting, you never know, okay? Just keep that in mind that Medicare reimburses any physician who wants to do a screening bedside ultrasound on any patient greater than age 55. Medicare will give you like 22 bucks. So <laughs> think about that, pay your loans off. Um, ultrasound has incredibly good test characteristics for abdominal aortic ultrasound, it's basically 100% sensitivity and 100% negative predictive value with very good inter-observer variability, which means that if I teach you, you, and you, we pretty much, you guys all do a very good job of doing it. It's very easy to do, basically, is what this means, okay? So after today, in the hands-on session, you will, for the rest of your life, feel very comfortable with this. This is not the case for appendicitis. That's very difficult. These are on complete opposite ends of the spectrum, okay? DVT aorta, way over here, very easy. Last week, appendicitis, challenging, okay? Very operative dependent. So anybody could have like back pain, flank pain, abdominal pain, thigh pain, groin pain, scrotal pain, buttock pain, just weak and dizzy. Syncope means passing out. They could be syncopal. They could be having cardiac. They could be standing right in front of you, running a code, you know? You're doing CPR. Why is this guy, you know? So... It's, it's, I really think about it in the case of uh, undifferentiated hypotension. So we're going to show you now how to figure out how to rule out a AAA. Recall that from anatomy that the spine follows the natural, cur the aorta follows the natural curvature of the spine. In other words, as you go from the head towards the feet, the vertebral bodies get larger and larger and larger, and that pushes the aorta actually more anterior, okay? 
and it's just left of the spine. This is a really cool CT scan, 3D renderization with the organs on, with the organs off. Very cool technology, I agree. The cost of 500 chest x-rays of radiation. Here is the aorta here coming, <laughs> coming down the left side of the body, correct? Here's the heart, so it's coming. So after it comes out of the, ab out of the chest and into the abdomen, that's when you can see it. You can't see it up here in the chest with ultrasound. That's one of the limitations of ultrasound. You can't see it the thoracic aorta, but you can see abdominal aorta very, very easily. You just keep pushing down until the spine shadow comes into play. The first branch of the abdominal aorta is called the celiac axis, okay? And then the second branch is the SMA. And you can see those things so easily on ultrasound. We can see right here with the schematic that that's the um, celiac axis right there in a sagittal plane, okay? And then on the transverse view here, we can see that little celiac axis just right up here. I know it's kind of hard to see, but it looks like a little seagull. We call that the seagull sign. I want to put some color here in the minute, and you'll see it better. But that's that celiac axis. It branches into three big ves three vessels, one of which is really small, which we don't really make out on ultrasound, which is the left gastric. But the other two we see quite easily, which is the splenic and the common hepatic. Very good. And you can see that Going off to the left, where the spleen lies, is the splenic artery, kind of going that way. And going off to the right, where the liver is, is the common hepatic artery. Yeah, let me, let me freeze it for you here. Hold on. Let me back it up. Right about, so it's not really good right here. Hold on. Oh, yeah, here we go. So this is the celiac axis coming up right here. And then, boom, splenic and common hepatic going that way. All right. Now, when you put some color on this, it looks like a seagull. So here's the aorta, celiac axis, splenic, and common hepatic. Thank you. Cool? All right. What's the next branch? SMA. We can see it over there on the sagittal view on that uh, image off to your left. And um, on ultrasound, this is an example here of a sagittal view with the aorta kind of running along here, and we can make out with the color here, this is that first branch celiac, second branch SMA, and this is just some flow left in the aorta where this happens to be picking it up. So just to kind of show you that while you don't need color flow really for much, uh, or really anything here, it's um, with the aorta, it just kind of helps to outline and give the aorta a little bit of definition for you. So we'll look at the aorta like we do most things in two different planes. First, um, on the plane over here on the left, you see the sagittal plane. In the plane over here, we see um, the, uh, the transverse plane. So to start it off, I'll talk about the transverse plane, because that's actually usually where I start, is with the transverse plane. I aim the indicator of the patient's right, and then I push down really hard, okay? But not like, you know, like with my hand, like bam, but like more like gentle, continuous pressure until I can see the spine shadow. And the spine shadow, looks like this, right here, that little spine shadow there, and I know just anterior to the spine shadow, and slightly to the spine shadow's left, is the aorta, and so to the right of the aorta would be the IVC, the IVC. exactly right. And this very thick walled structure here that surrounds this circle, looks kind of like a mantle clock sometimes, that's the, that's the SMA, and then this little worm that's crawling over the SMA, splenic vein, okay? And then the organ that lies right on top of the splenic vein is the pancreas. Here's the tail of the pancreas. Here's the body of the pancreas. Now, based on this probe's footprint, which probe do you think we're using? C60, exactly right. So we don't have those upstairs. We've got the P21s, and they do okay, but ideally, when you're talking about the aorta, the C60 does make the best images. So once again, a little repetition. Sorry about that. What's this? Spine shadow. What vessel is this? Aorta. Aorta. Good. What's this? IVC. IVC. What's this right here? SMA. SMA. It looks a little more like a mantle clock. Do you know what I mean by that? Maybe you guys know what the mantle clock is. Okay. Okay. All right. And then what's crawling over this mantle clock? What's this worm that's crawling over SMA? Splenic. Splenic vein. Good. And what's this organ out here? In this case, we really only see the head of it. Pancreas. And then this is all the, the liver where you can see that left lobe of the liver sort of coming over here and tapering off maybe over here. So 
first of all, where's the splenic vein going? Who's it meeting up with? Superior mesenteric vein. Superior mesenteric vein. Inferior already joined it. So it meets up with superior mesenteric vein to make portal vein. Exactly right. So the liver is trying to get all the blood from the spleen and the gut and then like filter, do its thing on it. Okay, that's kind of how I think of it. The other thing is, what's getting nut cracked between the aorta and the SMA? What's this little blood vessel here that's trying to get into the IVC? That's the left renal vein. So the kidney's kind of like off the screen. We don't see it here. But we do see the left renal vein get nut cracked between aorta and SMA. Cool? All right. So the way you do this is you start high up in the epigastrium with the indicator to the patient's right. And you're going to examine it. By the way, these are, these are nipples. This is my trying to wait. It. It's not eyes. Everybody thinks those are eyes. I'm not, eyes. I'm not doing this on the face. This is, this is my terrible drawing here. If anybody can draw, let me know, and you're more than happy to uh, take your drawings. Um, so we, we, we're trying to do like a transverse plane here, the indicator to the right. I push down really hard, and I drag the probe down towards, I drag it inferiorly until the aorta bifurcates into the iliacs. There's two types of aneurysms. One is a concentrically dilated type called a fusiform, and the other one is like a sac. It comes off the side of the aorta. Now let me ask you this. If you could use either a sagittal view or a transverse view, which one would pick up both types of aneurysms? Excellent. Yeah, transverse, because let's say we're doing sagittal first. So over here, sagittal, it would pick up the fusiform, right? Because it's concentrically dilated. But if we do sag if we do sagittal right here, it might look normal because we might miss this sac hanging off the aorta here. Whereas transverse, we're like, okay, normal, 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 whoa, aorta aneurysm, normal, normal, normal. Over here, we're like, normal, 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 uh-oh. So that's how transverse would pick them both up. Now, the one thing about sagittal that you got to be careful with is if you're off axis, you could shorten the measurement. What does that mean? So right now, we're along the exact dead center of the aorta, so we're getting the anterior to posterior diameter measured just right. If we're off axis or off to the side, we may shorten this measurement and have a, and actually measure it too small and not have a trip and miss the AAA. So you want to make sure that's why I like the transverse plane better. Another reason I like it better because you don't have to worry about being off axis. You're looking at a round circle on the screen and you just measure from the top to the bottom of it versus a tubular structure. This is what a AAA looks like. Some. Um, and in this right here is the reason why you cannot rely on your hands to make this diagnosis. Okay, I'll show you why. This is the outside calcification of the aorta out here. That's what that echogenic line is right there. So this is the outside of the aorta, okay? And then down here, this is the posterior part of the aorta. So this is anterior, this is posterior. And this is what's the lumen, this is where the blood's moving right now. What's all this stuff? What's this? clotted blood, what we call mural thrombus. So this is all, that mural thrombus is what provides a dampening mechanism, which is why you don't always feel this on physical exam. Okay, it's hard to pick these up sometimes because you expect to see like a big pulsating abdominal mass, but instead, this is the thing that's pulsating way down here underneath all this clot. But the whole thing is the aneurysm. Make sense? That's why that classic triad is not present uh, more than a third of the time. You see a lot of mural thrombi as we go through some of these aneurysms. So here's our spine shadow, and then this is a aneurysm over here. And you can just kind of eyeball it, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, maybe one more, six centimeters, if I had to come across to here. And in fact, for the normal ones, I don't even stop and measure them anymore. I just look over at the side of the screen and go, oh, they're less than two. Everybody's aorta in this room right now is less than two centimeters. And so it doesn't make sense to like stop and drag the calipers over it and measure it exactly right, unless it looks large. Here's another example of a, another AAA with this sort of, uh, I don't know how you would describe this, lenticular or serpentigenous clot that's kind of going around here. We can see that mural thrombus all around that. And this is the, the lumen here. This is what's left of the lumen. Um, really, um, 
all along between the, that epigastric area all the way down to the bifurcation, anywhere along there. So most of them are below where the renals come off. Some of them extend even higher than the renals. We call suprarenal, where the renal ar arteries come off. Some of them are super, most are infrarenal. I forgot the breakdown, but I know that most are infrarenal or below the renal arteries. So somewhere between the renal arteries come off and where the bifurcation is. Now this one looks like it's small. So here's the spine shadow. We've got the depth out here to 13, but if we could decrease that depth, well, now that thing really takes up some real estate. So now it looks like how could you ever miss this, right? And this is only a little tiny 3.5, 3.6 centimeter aneurysm. Pretty easy to pick up. That's why the test characteristic is so good here. So for the abnormal aortas, they're really like obvious. Sometimes you'll struggle to find a normal one because there's a patient's really large or something, but the abnormal ones are, are pretty easy to pick up. Just another example of an aortic aneurysm is a clot up here. And this is the lumen down here but you would measure from the outside wall all the way down to here. Go through a couple more examples of these, and then we're done. So this is the, the whole aorta here. Here's the lumen, here's the clot. And again, you can always eyeball these centimeters over here. You can get an idea that's about a you know, seven or eight centimeter AAA. Here we're going sagittal to show you what one looks like. It looks like a big sausage stretching across the screen here on a sagittal view. It's kind of cool to see those that way sometimes. Now this one looks kind of small at first, just at the top of the screen, but what we're going to do is we're going to maximize our screen real estate. Eventually they decrease the depth here and it takes up much more of the screen. So that's why I always harp on the depth. You can see now the depth got a little smaller. Here's that vertebral shadow. And this is the end. I would even take it down a lot I would shorten the depth even more so this takes up even more screen real estate. So it looks like when they're saccular, we can see there's a saccular kind of thing coming off over here. See this little saccular aneurysm there? And there's one I think that extends this way on some of these cuts as well. You could throw some flow on there to see kind of what's lighting up. You'll get flow going to and fro all over the place. What's this diagnosis? Here's the spine shadow right here. We've got it zoomed. You know, our depth is pretty decreased. What do you think is going on here? We're in the sagittal plane now. Pay close attention to this line right here. Yeah, what is that? How would you describe this? It looks like a big valve. Now, arterial structures don't have valves. Only veins do. So what the heck is this? Someone said it already. It's a dissection. So this is, an, this is an aortic dissection, and that's an intimal flap that you see going along there. So if that separates away, if the intimal flap separates away from the rest of the wall of the aorta, blood can come right down in between this intimal flap and the outside wall and push this intimal flap even more anteriorly, and eventually you can occlude the flow of blood down the aorta. And that's an aortic dissection. Different than an aneurysm, right? The aneurysm was that giant structure. The dissection is this flap that comes off. Okay, so what blood vessel is this? IVC. So the reason I ask that is because I want you to try to figure out what this little vessel is right here. By the way, how do I know that's the IVC, not the aorta? Because I see all this liver here. Okay. Another reason why I like the transverse view better, because I can see at the same time on the transverse view, both IVC and aorta together. Sagittal, you only get to see one or the other. So it's very possible to mistake the IVC for the aorta and say it's normal. Another good reason to go transverse. But anyways, this is the IVC, because I see the liver everywhere. And what do you think this vessel is right here? Think back to last week. Portal vein. It's got hypercoke walls to it. So those walls are very hypercoke. Okay, good. So here's the IVC. Now, what's behind, what runs perpendicular and posterior to the IVC? Pretty prominent vessel, pretty important vessel there. Anybody?
right renal artery. So that's the right renal artery. And it makes sense because it's coming from the left side of the body to get over to the right side of the body. And the way it does that, it has to go behind the IVC, which is why we see it kind of pooching into the IVC here. We see it on every patient, jumps off the screen. And that way you know what level, if you're at the level of the renals or not. Okay. One more time with the anatomy then. Um, what's this? Good. What's this? What's this? What's crawling over SMA? Splenic vein, very good. What's this tissue out here? Pancreas, liver. And what's getting nut cracked here? Left renal vein dumping in the IVC. Very good. Okay. Cool? Now let's talk more about the IVC. This is something that's really, really cool. I'm jumping ahead a little bit to some physiology here without getting too deep into it. Um, the IVC dumps into the right atrium. So you can approximate the pressure in the right atrium by looking at the IVC and how the IVC responds during inspiration. So as you breathe in, the IVC collapses, okay? Depending on your level of hydration. So if you're really dehydrated, like you, you know, you're dehydrated and you look at your IVC and you breathe in, you'll see that IVC collapse down, the walls will touch. It's pretty cool. But if you've got a lot of fluid, if, you're, if you have congestive heart failure and your fluid overload state, and when you breathe in, your IVC doesn't even budge, and it's really dilated, you need diuresis, or you need to have that, you need to take a medication like Lasix to get rid of some of that fluid, to pee it off, okay? Now, the, the old way of doing this, which is actually still done almost everywhere, is by putting a gigantic catheter into the jugular vein and putting a transducer down the jugular vein into the right atrium, and then you get a pressure measurement on the screen that, that tells you the central venous pressure. Okay, that's what CVP stands for, central venous pressure. And then you can decide what to do with your fluids. So you can give the patient more fluids or less fluids based on the CVP. And that's especially true when you have patients who are in shock, like septic shock. And so that's where this all kind of will play in for you later in your clinical years. But, um, but I just want to give you that sort of preamble right now that you can actually estimate the right atrial pressure non-invasively by looking at the diameter of the IVC and how it, and how it collapses during inspiration. So if the IVC is like really, really small and you breathe in, collapses down, then your right atrial pressure is really low and you're, you need some fluids. And then you've got all these numbers here. When it's really big, like more than 2.5 centimeters, you can just measure with the cal calipers. And then the patient breathes in and it doesn't move at all, then their CVP is over 20. Just kind of put that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to this quite a bit. This is what it looks like. Um, this is a patient who's breathing in and out. There's absolutely no change of their IVC. If I had to look over here at these calipers, maybe it's about 1.5 or 2 centimeters. I mean, I'm not dropping calipers here, but I'm just kind of demonstrating that. Here's one that's a really small IVC that, could, that as they breathe in, sort of collapses down. And we can see this collapsibility here going on. As they breathe in, it just completely obliterates. So that's a really low CVP. This is somebody where I'm like opening up the IV fluids on. Another example here of a, of, a, of a dilated IVC, no respiratory change, high central venous pressure. This is the heart right here. This is the right atrium of the heart. Here's the IVC coming across the screen underneath the liver. This is the hepatic vein right here. People always say, well, where do I measure the IVC? Over here, over here, over here. Hotly debated topic. Probably two centimeters distally to where the hepatic vein dumps in to the IVC. So that would be maybe around here is where I would, where most people agree to measure the IVC diameter. I'm just throwing this out there. It's going to come up over and over and over again. I want you guys to be aware of it and how powerful that can be. Any questions about the IVC, CVP stuff? Okay. Yes? The filter lands uh, much more distal to this. Much, uh, usually down lower. 
distally, not underneath the liver, but distally, typically. Okay, so today with the hands-on session, we're gonna do compression of the femoral vein and the popliteal vein, okay? You'll, you'll see how fast this goes today. It's gonna be a pretty quick scanning session, I think, because you're just compressing the fem area, and then you go down to the pop, and then you're gonna follow the aorta down to it bifurcates, and then I want you to look at the IVC and how it collapses during inspiration. That's about it. If you wanna move on, ask other questions, you have time left in your group, by all means, scan whatever you want today. Use it as kind of a free scanning session to tighten up wherever else you have questions, heart, whatever it is you wanna do. But really today, it's the DVT aorta and IVC.